Hi, good morning. Um, since we are ahead of time, I, I make another remark that I do not have on the slides. I re I just remembered when I first encountered WuFind back in, I think, 2008 or nine, maybe. It was not the one, WuFind one yet, I think. Um, and I've uh, at the time I was working at the State and University Library in Hamburg, and we were about to create our own discovery system using metadata aggregation scripts we'd developed previously for a Fachinformationsdienst. This is something we Germans talk about often. These are special subject platforms, like Janis talked about one for pharmacy. And we, we've, we've done that for politics in Hamburg, and we had these scripts, and we were like, why not use it for the library metadata? And we went ahead and did it, and it went well. We did it in Perl, and um, it was very... Uh, it was very local and not sustainable at all. And then we looked into WooFind and we went like, oh, this might be a good idea. But then we decided not to go with WooFind at the time because we felt it was newish. We didn't knew we didn't know you guys. <laughs> so um, we um, we we decided to go ahead with our own tools and um, we felt that we knew better. And knowing knowing better is something we, we often indeed do, but this prevents us oftentimes from creating real cooperation between libraries. So we have these many WUFIND sub-communities here in Germany, QCovery you've heard about, Fink you've heard about, and um, maybe we've come to a stage now when we think about integrating large language models or uh, knowledge graphs or something like that, but we should cooperate more on our interfaces and indexes to make time to implement these um, new ideas and not just focus on what drives us locally or what, what we have built locally. Maybe we should, we have to let go of more things. Anyway, this um, I'm, I'm telling you this because, yeah, I do want to share learned lesson where where are the lessons the lessons learned from more than 30 um, projects for discovery projects with libraries that i've done since i've worked for 20 years in libraries um and uh, for about five years i've spent my time doing project management work and consulting uh, with libraries on implementation of discovery so whatever mistakes i'm reporting on strategic mistakes technical mistakes technical not 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 good uh, um, technical discussions they are mine as well they are not the ones of the libraries or uh, who find or anything so how does this work i when i prepared this talk i was reminding myself who or what drives discovery what who 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 in who gave us the idea to create discovery in the first place and where where are we at now so what i came up with is um actually at least in germany i feel that the library users initiated discovery because libraries realized uh, at ar around 20 25 years ago users were searching elsewhere not in library catalogs, which they do now as well. So uh, libraries have lost their monopoly, um, but they drove us to think about using our Perl scripts and uh, creating user interfaces and creating creating search engines. I think we have then spent about 10 to 15 years getting librarians on board and um, we have, when I look at what we built back in 2007, um, it looked very different from, from what we see now. We have, we have much longer detail views with very uh, comprehensive metadata. Back then we had very short title views and uh, not including that many mark fields in, in, in all views. So um, also, and, and I will give you a, a few examples for this. I think we, we have, um, we have been through a time where librarians have primarily influenced discovery by um, trying to make it more like the OPAC, because the OPAC did have very useful f functionality indeed, and uh, it was um, it was very vital. But it still is very vital for many projects to integrate OPAC functionality into discovery systems. 
and as we've learned yesterday, there are machines. I, I was I was thinking if uh, whether to put machines or data on the slide. I, I decided for machines, but it could be data as well. Um, I think. The future drive. We, we have see, we have all seen that the future driver of discovery could be machines or could be data. Um, that we have we we do create a lot of data and we have um, we have um, solutions and principles like knowledge graphs or large large language models that could let us our exploit our data better and do something well not completely different but maybe more courageous, maybe more geared towards uh, a topical search, not just focus on known item searching, I don't know. Um, so to go into a bit of detail, I put on the slides that the users are only rarely asked about discovery. Um, I did this before I knew that we had these talks uh, from Clemens and uh, Annette and Angela telling us so much about how they used, uh, how they asked their users. And I loved those results. I particularly loved that the Staatsbibliothek was addressed as Brudi, which is like, dude. <laughs> Um, so obviously the relationship between libraries and their users have changed too, but we should ask them more and we should, we, we should listen to what they say about discovery be before we spend hours uh, conceptualizing and implementing complicated facets or um, other stuff. So we, we have known for a long time, even though it did came uh, as quite a... Um, 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 surprise for you or you were kind of disappointed by it in Berlin that users use discovery mainly for known item searching but this is what what uh, the the studies that are out there have been uh, suggesting from the start basically it's not it's not the the, the search for a topic that's uh, the, the key thing and we know that users use many other systems as well beside the discovery service so that's that, that's something that should be considered. So then when we look at the librarians, we have seen that they oftentimes thought that many parts of discovery are sort of a black box. What happens to my data that I create in my library management system? How does it end up like this? How could this be? Where, where is my subfield? How does the ranking work? Uh, things like that. We have also seen that li librarians have had a lot of trouble letting go of search paradigms that are central to any um, library introduction class, like using Boolean search operators. This is this is totally not the logic of a search engine, um, and uh, this is a paradigm that needs to that that has changed. And um, do we perhaps try to use our old paradigms on discovery unjustly? I don't know. Anyway, I do think that librarians do have uh, have had the most impact on the current states, e state of discovery, even if they are oftentimes unhappy with it. Um, the machines, like I said, I think they can allow for other forms of metadata exploitation we haven't thought about yet. And uh, however, I feel that they are currently just too expensive and too experimental to be used in an average discovery system. I, I'll get back to that uh, uh, hypothesis a bit later. So, um, yeah, as I said, I want to present some lessons learned and, and uh, talk about some deeper issues I feel that are out there and show you some really good practices, even though we have seen them right here within these last hours um, today and yesterday. The main thing, and um, this is no surprise, I, I think, but it, I think it is important to stress that discovery is not a descendant of the OPAC. It does not derive from the OPAC. It's something completely different. Um, and um, I asked around for um, for this talk and for some other talks. Uh, I, I I spoke to Martin Blenkle from. And they did, they implemented the first discovery system in, in Germany back in 2004 or six. 
And I asked him, what, what, what would you change if you could start over? And he said, well, I would bother totally less with the uh, availability of information on print titles. This is something that I personally and many of my colleagues have spent hours and hours on. Um, seeing that the availability information, the uh, indicators, the item statuses are displayed in the correct way. And this can take a lot of time, and Janis has just reported on a solution where we try to make this work feasible, but um, we are still spending a lot of time on um, displaying availability information on print titles. Um, we have seen, though, that discovery systems have been unmasking very complicated circulation rules and item information in the legacy system. And I'm sad to say that I see some of these mistakes repeated in current folio installations where I know that there are projects out there where a lot of money and time is spent on implementing German-specific circulation rules and fee rules especially. Fees are very important. Um, in, in, in the system, and I think um, from a, from a strate library strategic point of view, this is something we should ask ourselves if it's worth it. Do we make enough money on the fees to, to uh, pay for all the development we have to make in order to make it work? I don't know. Well, I, I think I know. Um, so another thing. This, this is one of the functionalities that librarians always look for in discovery system, the, the search for car numbers. So, hi, Alex. <laughs> Moin. So, um, we have libraries that do not have one system of car numbers, like, but maybe something like 12 or 28. And all these call number, the way these call numbers are built are, are very different from each other. And it's, as anyone knows who has implemented WooFind knows, this is very hard uh, to do. And um, we have seen the statistics from Berlin. I don't know if you have a search field for call number and if you have information, you do? And how often has it been used? She goes like this. Um, well, we have to ask ourselves, is it worth making WooFind be able to compute all these call number structures, um, or do we just not offer a call number search? Isn't a call number search that something that a librarian would do? Does a user actually search for a call number? I'm not asking you, I'm asking myself, but go ahead. Um, anyway, the question is, I, Many, many discovery systems are called OPAC plus, actually. I, I have, I myself have implemented more than two systems, WooFind based discovery systems that are called OPAC plus. And this is, this is one of the many defeats, I'd say, because I, I feel that discovery should exist in its own right and should, should, um, we should make decisions of what functionality to put in it and whatnot. Um, ranking. Annette, I was so amazed by your talk yesterday. You really blew my mind because you gave an, an, a perfect example of how a librarian like yourself can work with WooFind, well, at the core of WooFind and, and help configuring WooFind. Um, it is not a, dev a software developer's work, and you have you have given us a, a very good example of what librarians can co contribute to the implementation of a discovery system. Um, something like the search box YAML is very easily understandable for a librarian. I I myself am not a big fan of explaining TF IDF algorithms to people. I'm I, I hate mathematics, and this does not put me in a really good position to do that, but. Um, it can be understood. It is not necessarily a black box. And uh, I think Damien has, uh, and, and his team, they have designed this functionality, especially to be, to be able to be understood easily. It's a YAML data. It's, it's not a formatter any whatnot that needs to be connected to the template. It's um, pretty straightforward. So, but still, my biggest defeats in, in, in ranking projects are 
uh, a customer said, well, I'm not happy with this. Make make a date descending, uh, sort by date descending the default. This is where I get really sad. Uh, another thing where I actually have ethical problems is uh, when a client asks me to specifically look for the names of the directors of the institutions and make sure these names get found really well and then key publications get it first. I, I try to ref refuse this, but it's very hard to do if you're a, a paid um, service provider. Um, another thing, the searches for Goethe and Schiller are not working well. Well, big surprise. <laughs> um, um, there are things that can't be solved with ranking. And uh, there is oftentimes a misconception about that. Um, but uh, ranking is something, in, in my experience, that is often discussed very early on in a discovery project and with very, um, it, it's discussed with a lot of emotions. And um, I don't, think that the the searches for Goethe and Schiller should work well. There are other ways to, to do that, uh, not the ranking, but um, this is something that oftentimes gives, does give, give me a headache. And I feel, especially with points like um, Goethe and Schiller do not work well, we, we see that these, this, this topic touches deeper issues, in my opinion. This touches, for instance, uh, the issue that the strategy of a discovery system is oftentimes not clearly defined. But I do feel that it's necessary to define target groups and use cases. Who is this discovery system for? And what does this person, uh, what is this person supposed to do with it? I mean, it's perfectly legitimate if you say we need a call number search and we need it for all of our 28 call number systems. But then this is this is a strategic decision. Um, if you if you were to say, well, I don't want the librarians in there as my target group, then you can maybe skip the call number search. I don't know. Um, this is this is one point. The other point is that I fear that there are usually more possibilities to create local meaningfulness than people would expect. What do, do I mean by this? I'm, I'm, you have a standard WooFind uh, system for us in Germany. It does. There are functionalities that are not really relevant, the, the, the browsing functionality. We do not use Dewey Decimal Classification. Like I said, any old library might have 28 uh, classification systems on its own. So it doesn't work for us. But we do have ways to create meaningfulness locally um, that we can use. And um, maybe it's worth exploring this before starting a, a, a discovery project. Um, something I often work with when I consult with libraries or other institutions is that I encourage them to write um, personas um, they can be as short as this. You can just say, well, I have these target groups. You, can, you should also define whether the librarians themselves, like I said, are part of the target group. So is this, this reference librarian who teaches first grade student orientation classes, is she the target group of the discovery system? She has to do her reference work with it. She has to teach people how to use it, but should all her use cases be in there? Yes or no. Um, I often see in my clients, they come to me and they go like, oh, my reference librarian came to me and she said, well, this and this doesn't work well. This is anecdotal evidence. And the person in charge of the discovery, they, they feel they, they should, they should uh, uh, be nice to their colleague and uh, make sure that their uh, needs are met. But I've, I see a lot of librarians who are um, um, res conceptually responsible for discovery systems who are very much pushed by their own colleagues who come around every time and go like, well, can, can, you, can you change this and uh, can you do, do that? This is, in my opinion, not helpful. And this is not a, a strategy. Oh, I mean, it could be a strategy, but then make it a strategy. Um, about the local content, what I have here is something that's actually not 
uh, online, so I can show you. But this is uh, a, a viewfind installation we have developed for the um, Institute for Foreign Cultural Policy in Stuttgart. And we integrated uh, something we called a navigator, where we um, uh, put uh, locally um, created um, content into discovery. So they write country reports, and they have a long list of institutions. And uh, they have a guide about internships and cultural poli politics institutions. And we tried to integrate this, these uh, reference materials they create there at their institutions into discovery and, and recommend these resources. So if anyone searches for France or cultural politics in France, they would get like uh, a country report on France and a list of institutions that are in France and, and whatnot. So, um, and we've heard yesterday and I, I, I am sad to say that this talk was technically a bit above my level, but the general idea to integrate uh, repositories with discovery system is a good one. Um, many university libraries have both a, a, a discovery system and a repository, and I see them seldomly integrated. Um, and this would be, in my opinion, a good um, way to make local content, local knowledge visible. I've been talking a lot in the past years about having recommendations from professors, librarians, the WooFind list functionality is a good uh, point to start there. Um, and topical pages might also help and be a first start into doing more for topic searches in, in WooFind. However, if you want to do this really in a sophisticated manner and not only concentrate on known item searching, these projects get expensive. Um, what I've brought here is the uh, catalog of the German Literary Archive. They have all kinds of Nachlasse, Nachlasse, whatever, um, letters and stuff from famous authors. And for, for them, obviously, it's very important to dif differentiate. Do you want to search letters from this author or do you want to search for letters about her? Do you want to search for her works or works about her works? And um, they 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 do really good exploitation of authority um, data here, but this has been really complicated. And for libraries that fret about the costs of migrating from Bootstrap three to Bootstrap five, this is not something you should think about at all if you're worried about uh, main basic maintenance of your system. So th th this is in a completely different league financially and conceptually also. Um, however, guided searching is an approach that also Maccabee Levine, yesterday he talked extensively about the bento boxes and recommending a, subject, a local subject library. And this is something that um, uh, goes in the same direction. Oops. Um, also, some libraries are um, uh, experimenting with circulation statistics. Uh, the left example is from Elib in Bremen. They, they put most popular titles on, on the results lists based on uh, circulation data, something that is basically directly covered from Amazon and other um, um, e-commerce sites. But um, could, couldn't that be useful? Or if this is too personal and, and this feels unethical, we do have so many WooFind installations in a context, in a regional context. Uh, as part of like a number of Berlin libraries, a number of Saxonian libraries, we could count the items on, on, on um, handbooks, in, on textbooks, introductory titles that librarians typically want to see on top of their results lists. It would, they would be on top of the results list if you counted how many libra libraries held that item. Um, journals would be um, on top of the results list if, if you counted how many uh, li libraries held subscriptions. It is data that's out there that just, uh, it would, I think it would be interesting to experiment with this. And I think some people do. If someone from Bavaria here, Robert Scheuerl has, has done this, I think. I don't know, we can talk later. Um, so I uh, hinted at funding uh, already, but um, 
I'm, I'm really sad to say that the funds are oftentimes eaten up for basic maintenance. This is a, a strategic problems of library directors. I mean, they have to make tough choices. They have to decide, do they want to buy new fancy chairs for the lounge or uh, what do they want to do? But um, I would like to stress that I think that the digital services are as important or more important than the on-site services and provisioning a discovery system with like 5,000 euros a year won't cut the chase. It, it just won't. Um, developing more know-how in-house is challenging. We at uh, Effective Web Work, we, we often try to uh, teach seminars or uh, do some pair programming, do workshops. And um, I, I, I can't count the number of, of who find basic introductions we have given, uh, but we always see that developing um, real um, uh, knowledge and, and hands-on practice on how to configure WooFind and how to take care of it is difficult. Again, uh, we've heard of some pretty good examples yesterday of how this can be done differently and successfully, obviously. Good practices, however, are rare. Um, we have a project where we um, have introduced something we call a relevance picker. We try to visualize how uh, the ranking um, uh, uh, happened for this particular results list. This is not uh, in, in, a, in a live installation as of yet. I'm not a biggest fan really of this functionality. I feel it's it doesn't touch the deeper issues. It just shows you it, this, this is uh, uh, high on the results list because it's a print title or whatnot. Um, however, there are, I think, ways where we could foster something like data literacy with our discovery systems and make it transparent how they how they work. Planning in discovery projects is another another big issue. Um, discovery is always ongoing. Just one, just an in, initial implementation doesn't mean it's finished. It it it, it never is. It has never it has never been and it, it will never be. Um, and I feel that implementation projects also need um, a more agile approach, if that's at all possible. I know many libraries are bound by tenders and Vergabeverordnung and uh, all sorts of restrictions, but we do have a very nice project at the moment with Max Planck libraries where we actually negotiate the, 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 the milestones and the, the deliverables in the process. And this is working really well, I feel. Oops, I'm not a fan of this. Okay. Um, yeah, agile approaches um, can work. I'm, I'm very sure of this. They, they, they can work within classic IT project um, structures. I just said, said that deliver, uh, negotiate deliverables during the project process, have a backlog. And I mean, you, you can mean you can put things on, on your backlog. It's not, it's fine. You don't have to make it all happen in the first phase or in, in a specific phase. So some remarks uh, on the future, and I don't want to talk about the elephant in the room because uh, the person after me will do this and Sören Auer did this yesterday. I think even without having large language models and, and knowledge graphs integrated into discovery systems, oops, uh, we, have, we have possibilities to do more with the data we have. I talked about circulation statistics, item counts, and um, I also think that the interoperability of our bibliographic meta metadata is something that's really important with um, also with regard to future integ integrations of large language models. But we need something like uh, I showed here. This is taken from Open Alex and every metadata element has an identifier and everything is interlinked with each other. An idea that has been around in, in libraries in forever, but we don't have that many um, discovery um, systems around that, that actually rely on these open, pr open principles that are not um, confined to library specific um, uh, um, systems of identifiers. So I think um, my last my last point, and this has been my first point um, as well, 
making discovery systems opaque like costs a lot of money and energy uh, and it does not leave enough room in my opinion for interoperability and innovation and i'm happy to discuss this further thank you <laughs>